Hello there, this is QTV News. I am Maria Masane and thanks for tuning in. First, the main local and international news headlines. After a tightly contested by-election in the Namino West constituency, which saw President Barr's newly formed NPP register their first electoral win, we spoke to the winning and losing candidates to get their reactions. The Secretary General and leader of the National People's Party, President Adam Barrow, is quite confident of a landslide victory in 2021 after Saturday's outcome in the Nyamina West and Kid Jarga Ward by elections. The People's Republic of China on Monday sent two teams of medical experts to the Gambia to help in the country's battle against the COVID 19 pandemic and contribute towards general healthcare service delivery. An unidentified witness, a Senegalese national dealing in palm oil business and a Gambian on Tuesday testified at the RRC about their encounter with the NIA. In international news, it has been announced by Malian state media that the country's former president, Amadi Toumani Touré, has died. Saib Irikat, one of the most prominent Palestinians of recent years, has died after contracting the coronavirus. Now the local news in detail. Stay tuned. After a tightly contested by-elections in the Nyamina West constituency, which saw President Barr's newly formed NPP register their first electoral win to the seat from the GDC, QTV's Omar Pijawa spoke to the winning and losing candidates to get their reactions. Here's what they said. The much talk about Nyamina West by-election has ended with the National People's Party NPP candidate defeating the Gambia Democratic Congress GTC candidate in all the nine polling stations with a big margin. The NPP candidate from JSO pulled 1,716 votes, while Yero Jalo of the GDC pulled 805 votes out of the 2,522 votes casted. The constituency have 4,375 registered voters, out of which 1,853 voters did not vote. The GDC camp accused the NPP of buying votes, citing NPP's alleged house-to-house -house night campaigning a day after the official deadline of campaigning as evidence. NPP officials denied the allegation. Already have accepted defeat because I already uh, yesterday when the results were announced and I found that I I was not fortunate. I went to meet the NPP candidate who is my nephew, uh, Biram So, to congratulate him. So uh, it was so uh, emotional anyway because uh, people never expected that this has never happened anyway. You know, in Yamina West, I am the first person who who did it. Uh, when there is an election and the, the, the losing uh, party, the losing candidate will go to the winning candidate and then congratulate him. Post-election violence are increasingly becoming globally and the Gambia had not been exempted. Despite fears expressed ahead of the election, the Nyamina West by election was free of pre- or post-election violence. As a sign of spirit in which the contest was fought, the losing GDC candidate Yero Jalo immediately after the announcement of the final results by the IEC, went to meet the winning NPP candidate Brom JSO and congratulated him on his victory and assured him of his support throughout his tenure. The feeling is not much emotional. It's just like a, uh, like a body age, uh, just like um, physically, or oh, um, just the fatigue, but it's not like emotionally. Because like I told you, since day one, I, I was expecting victory and then, you know, it's, a, it's something that was expected, you know, it's not a surprise. So if it was a surprise, then the emotional feeling would have been, you know, much expected. But I'm normal, it doesn't take me anywhere, it's just that I'm grateful and thankful, you know, to my people who voted for me and the NPP party for the support and from His Excellency and the First Family. Yero Jalo said this was in fulfillment of his campaign promise to reunite the people of Nyamina West after the by-election, a message he had been preaching throughout his campaign. This is a big concern and I cannot just be saying uh, we need to be united without people seeing the sample coming from me. You know, in as much as that was my motto, that was my, my, my motive, even if I lose, 
I have to contribute towards seeing the reunification of the people. Reacting to Yero's gesture, a visibly happy Brom JSO expressed appreciation and described Yero as a true patriot while calling on the electors to emulate them and put aside their political differences. I was expecting it because if he had won, I would have done the same thing. And there is that cordial relation between me and Yero. Like I always said, we are childhood friends and we do advise each other, we do call, we met at IC, we hug each other and then people did not, you know, it was, there is no difference. So like he promised to work with us or me, so he's welcome. If at all he had already also warned me, I would have done the same thing. So I was happy with his brother yesterday, Demba. They came together and Uncle Pate. So it's one family. It remains to be seen whether the electorates of Nyamine West will allow politics to divide them or follow the footsteps of the candidates and put their political differences aside and focus on their shared development aspirations. <laughs>
A similar gesture he extended to other MPs in 2017. <laughs> Reporting for QTV News, I am Alu Sise. The People's Republic of China on Monday sent two teams of medical experts to the Gambia to help in the country's battle against the COVID-19 pandemic and contribute towards general health care service delivery. This development is in response to the Gambia government's request to its Chinese counterparts for support to our health system. Mungu Lamin Choi reports. When the coronavirus hit the world, China made headlines as the first country to record a case of the deadly virus. This was a few months before the virus became a global pandemic, and the Chinese government has since called for a global fight against the pandemic, ruling out medical support to overseas countries, including the Gambia. As the Gambia's sincere friend and partner, China has in return been extending our helping hands when the Gambia fights its own battle against COVID-19. The Chinese government and the prominent civil organizations have so far provided the Gambia with nine consignments of critically needed medical equipment and the PPEs. This is the 36th batch of Chinese overseas medical experts with the mission of supporting the fight against the pandemic. This footage by China's global TV network was a live broadcast of the departure ceremony for the medical team to the Gambia from Shenyang, capital of China's northeast Liaoning province. There is the anti-medical epidemic team on a three-month mission focusing on tackling COVID-19 in the Gambia. This first team of health experts is a combination of nine medics specializing in critical care, infectious disease, and respiratory medicine. They are welcome to the Gambia together with another team of medical experts by the Chinese ambassador and the minister of health. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, but we want more. We want more specialists to come and do hands-on in our health facilities to work with our team of doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals in the Gambia to deliver the required services to COVID-19 patients. This is the first time for the term of our COVID-19 experts teams overseas work gets as long as three months. Instead of more common arrangement of only 15 days, the second batch of 10 medical experts from the same province consists of medical specialists in gynecology, general surgery, orthopedics, and other medical fields. They are on a one-year mission during which their focus will be on offering support at hospitals on general health services to help improve the Gambia's health care system. We want to have a very strong, robust health system so that even if we have a surge, we'll be able to deal with it. We pray we don't have a surge, but if we do, we'll be able to deal with it. But we also want to build our resilience in dealing with any future pandemic if it should occur again by sharing your experience. So you'll be kept very, very busy here in the Gambia. We thank you very much. These Chinese health experts will be followed by medical supplies purchased by the Chinese government as a strategy towards their mission of supporting the Gambia's health system. From 2017 to date, this is the fourth batch of 42 medical personnel from the Chinese province of Liaoning. This is an outcome of deepening friendly bilateral relations between two countries that reconciled in the wake of Adam Abaro's election as president. Mahmoud Lamin, QTV News. An unidentified witness, a Senegalese national dealing in the palm oil business on Tuesday, told the TRRC that he was arrested by the NIA and incarcerated for four years, having been accused of being a terrorist. His testimony was followed by Harun Nagasama, a native of the Gambian, hailing from the Central River region. Bob Krasi tells us more. The witness said he is a businessman who came to the country in 1999. In 2006, he said four NIA officers paid him a visit at night and took him to the Kotu police station where he spent the weekend and later taken to the NIA headquarters where for the first time he was told the reason for his arrest. According to the witness, he was asked if he knew anyone called Asanba, which he replied in the negative. According to him, he came to realize that the NIA officers were looking for the Jola woman's husband, whose number he gave to the NIA officers before they stopped beating him. He struck me twice on my back. The witness said after the NIA found out the truth, they refused to release him and told him that if he is released, he would go around saying what they did to him. Thus, they had to keep him incarcerated. 
He said after weeks in detention at the NIA, he was transferred to the Mile 2 Central Prison with 12 others and kept at the security wing. The witness said one of the NIA officers went to his house and told his wife that if the family paid them money, he would be released. And according to him, his wife gave the NIA officer $70,000. Despite this, he was never released. He said he was incarcerated at the Mile 2 prisons from June 3, 2007 to June 2009 when he and 16 other inmates were taken to become a magistrate court charged with terrorism. He said the case was transferred to the High Court in Banjul and after months of adjournments, they were later discharged by a Gambian judge after previously appearing before a Nigerian judge, Justice Ekpala. The suffering I went through up to this day, I feel the pain on my body. Except the pain my family also felt, but personally, I think I felt more pain than anybody else in the family. The witness said he spent four years in prison before he was finally acquitted and discharged. Next to appear was Haruna Gasama from the Central River region, who in 2012 was chosen as president of the farmers at the Jahali Pacha rice field. Mr. Gasama told the commission that his predecessors refused to hand over the mantle of leadership to him and his new team and they decided to write a letter addressing it to the President of the Republic, which they gave to the Governor of CRR, Wajwara. This letter, the witness said he was invited by the police and told that he was under arrest and was charged with giving false information. They were saying that that letter I wrote to the President was the letter carrying false information. And I never saw that document in front of all these magistrates telling me this is the document you wrote. And apart from that also, they didn't bring out any other document. According to the witness, he was taken to the Janjambre prisons and was sentenced to six months in jail with hard labor. He said they didn't complete the whole sentence as during a tour of the provinces, the ex-president Yaya Jame released them and they went back to their families. The witness told the commission that he continued to pursue his leadership as the head of the Jahali Pacha rice field and took the matter to court, which he won, and the court ordered the ex-executive to hand over the materials to him, which the sheriff's department implemented. But days later, he was re-arrested by the police, ordered to return all the materials to the ex-executive, and the NIA later came for him and took him to their headquarters in Banjul, where he was kept for six months and later discharged. Babu Karsi, QTV News. We will go for a short commercial break, and when we come back, the news continues with some more local news stories. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. The Ministry of Health through the Malaria Control Program in collaboration with Banjul City Council today launched the use of fogging machine aimed at reducing the prevalence of malaria in Banjul and beyond. As Geneva Senko reports, the Minister of Health says his ministry is working towards the total eradication of malaria in the Gambia. According to a World Health Organization report in 2018, the Gambia has made considerable progress in the fight against malaria. The overall malaria parasite prevalence in the country is only 0.2% compared to 4% in 2018, indicating a significant decline of more than 90% in all the health regions of the country. According to the National Malaria Control Program, the Gambia is currently at 0.1% malaria prevalence. The purchase of the $20,000 fogging machine is part of investments in strategies that address socioeconomic disparities and improvements in the quality of housing that could in the long term significantly reduce the malaria burden in the poorest communities. It's only for outdoor spraying so that it can kill all the mosquitoes and insects that you know that fly especially in the evening. You know, you know the objective is to get rid of mosquitoes and uh, insects that can bite or that are biting people so that people will live a very comfortable life and can be able to sit outside and then comfortably you know rest and you know chat outside. 
The Minister of Health and Social Welfare, Dr. Ahmadu Lamin Samata, says eradicating malaria is a collective responsibility and therefore called on Gambians to embrace this activity in their respective communities. The Gambia has done very well when it comes to dealing with malaria. We are working very hard to eliminate malaria from the source of this country. But of course, we cannot do that without dealing with the vectors of the plasmodium, that is the mosquito. He added that health inspectors will commence operations soon to ensure a healthy environment. The regional principal public health officer, Musa Kamara, says it is important to start the insecticide spraying in the capital city, considering the drainage system in the capital can be an ideal breeding space for mosquitoes. He added that the insecticide is harmless to human beings. From the president down to um, the last person in the Ministry of Health, when it comes to decision making, we uh, any intervention that is brought in, in this country, um, it is usually pre-qualified either by WHO or other agencies. So we will not bring anything here that is going to affect the health and well-being of the people. So whatever interventions are uh, being taken, this chemical fogging, it will go a long way towards addressing the socio-economic problem of the Gambia. Elijah Job is a resident of Banjul and he applauds the Ministry of Health for coming up with such an initiative, but was quick to call on his fellow Banjulians to adjust their behaviours in relation to indiscriminate dumping of both solid and liquid waste. We took the opportunity to engage the Minister of Health, Ahmed Lamin Samate, on the status of coronavirus in the country. According to Samate, Gambia is no different from other countries currently experiencing a second wave, thus the need to be cautious. Everybody in the Gambia should be on the alert. That is why we appeal, in fact we are pleading for people to continue to follow the guidelines. Let us continue the social distancing, let us continue putting on the mask, let us continue the hand washing. We have been seeing the same second wave in other countries. Why do we think we are an exception in the Gambia? Malaria is commonly associated with unclean environment. Poverty, macro level estimates, show strong links between malaria and poverty. For instance, the malaria boarding is highest in the poorest countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa where poverty is widespread and with little economic growth over the past quarter century. Therefore, with the use of this insecticide fogging machine sustainably, coupled with attitudinal change, malaria eradication is possible. The deputy mayor of Banjul was also present at the event. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jenna Basonko. Fourteen students have graduated from the Bilal boarding school after memorizing the Holy Quran. As Babu Karsi reports, it took the graduates between one to nine days to memorize the holy book. Allah revealed the glorious Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, while he was worshipping in the cave of Mount Hira near Makkah by Angel Jibril. Reading the Quran continuously is one of the best acts of worship. The Muslim who memorizes the Quran has countless bountiful features in this life and in the hereafter. Allah has said that the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. Allah also said that the Quran will protect and defend the one who reads it on the day of resurrection. Reciting even one letter of the Quran rewards us with multiple good deeds. The Quran was revealed by Allah to the final prophet Muhammad to angel Jibril over a period of 23 years beginning in the month of Ramadan when Muhammad was 40. Surat al-Alaq was the first surah that was revealed in the Holy Quran. The surah starts with the word Ikra which means read. The principal of Bilal boarding school, Esa Cham, advises parents to guide their children in the right direction. Memorizing the Quran is not easy at all. You face beatings, sickness, hunger and sleepless nights for a period of four or five years. Don't let that go in vain. Parents will advise children to worship God, to know what clothes to wear and to respect elders. The 
the parents of the one who memorizes the Quran will be honored in the hereafter as they are adorned with the crown on the day of resurrection. Mariama Danso, a mother whose daughter Fatumata Conte has graduated, is looking forward to being blessed on that day. This is a blessing that will benefit us in this world and hereafter. I thank Allah because I am very happy. I would like to thank the school authorities for our job well done. This is a blessing that will benefit me in this world and hereafter. I would like to thank my aunties, my parents and my teachers. Following Prophet Muhammad's death in 632, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, subsequently decided to collect the book in one volume and ordered a group of scribes, most importantly, Zaid ibn Tabit, to produce a handwritten manuscript of the complete Quran. After Abu Bakr's death, the third caliph, Usman ibn Afang, ordered a committee to prepare a standard copy of the Quran. The present form of the Quran text is accepted by Muslim scholars to be the original version compiled by Abu Bakr. Bilal Boarding School is also facing financial constraints like other institutions. The CEO, Esa Jawara, thanked those who have supported him for nearly 20 years and appeals for help. I want those who are well off to help me. This school can accommodate 1,000 students and I cannot afford it alone. If I get support, I will be able to pay teachers and all the students can enroll for free education. The CEO of Bilal Boarding School, Esa Jawara, added that 255 students have memorized the Quran since the school was established in December 2001. Even though 500 students are on free education and others at the New Yundum branch pay $1 a day for feeding, Jawara says the debt he is owed by parents of students is $3 million. Bab Karsise, QTV News. We will take another short break and we continue with international news when we return. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, this is QTV News. In international news, it has been announced by Malian state media that the country's former president, Amadou Toumani Touré, has died. More in this report. Amadou Toumani Touré, ATT, as he was popularly called, was president of Mali from 2002 to 2012. He originally came to public notice, though via a coup d'etat. Touré was head of the then president, Moussa Traoré's personal guard, when a popular revolution overthrew the regime in March 1991, and Colonel Touré arrested the president and led the revolution. Moussa Touré had led a dictatorial regime for 22 years. In an unusual move for Africa, and as promised, Touré presided over a year-long military-civilian transition process that produced a new constitution and multi-party elections, the first in the country since independence. Touré handed power to Mali's first democratically elected president, Alpha Omar Konare, who assumed office in June 1992. Konare promoted Toure to the rank of general. Konare served two five-year terms, and by the end of his second term, ATT had left the army to contest as a civilian and won the 2002 election. He too was to serve for 10 years. On 22 March 2012, shortly before he had said he would leave office, having served 10 years, this gruntled soldier staged a coup d'etat, though he was not captured, but instead went into hiding. As part of the agreement to restore constitutional order to Mali, Toure resigned from the presidency on 8 April, and 11 days later, he went into exile in neighboring Senegal. He remained popular in his home country and in 2017, though he made it clear he would not be getting involved in domestic politics. However, he remained active in promoting other causes that were dear to him. He was a member of the Art Charter Initiative Organization, which promotes an international declaration of fundamental values and principles considered useful by its supporters for building a just, sustainable 
and peaceful global society in the 21st century. The Charter seeks to inspire in all peoples a sense of global interdependence and shared responsibility for the well-being of the human family, the greater community of life, and future generations. Tude died today in Turkey, where he had gone for medical treatment. He was 72, and his death comes two months after that of Musa Traore, whom he overthrew in 1991. News. May his soul rest in peace. Saib Erikat, one of the most prominent Palestinians of recent years, has died after contracting the coronavirus. Here is the report. The announcement from Palestinian party Fatah said the veteran PLO negotiator died today from complications from COVID-19, having been hospitalized in October. Erikat, who was also secretary general of the PLO, was being treated in the coronavirus intensive care unit of Jerusalem's Hadassah Ain Kerim Hospital with severe respiratory problems after being transferred from the West Bank in October. He was placed on a ventilator and put into a medically induced coma last month. He underwent lung transplant surgery in the United States in 2017, which is why there were fears for his health when he was admitted to hospital. It was therefore no surprise when the hospital announced, and I quote, Mr. Erekat is a challenge to treat for coronavirus since he had lung transplants. He is immunosuppressed and has another bacterial infection in addition to coronavirus. End of quotation. For many years, Erekat was one of the most internationally recognized Palestinian faces as he traveled the world seeking friends and allies to help bring a peaceful settlement to his homeland. Erekat has been involved as a frontline negotiator for the Palestinian cause since 1991 and took part in almost all the meaningful negotiations since. In that time, he has served as a senior negotiator in peace talks with Israel and is well known on the international media circuit. In the West, Erekat is known as one who always proposed the two-state solution involving Israel and Palestine as the only way to lasting peace in the region. Erekat was greatly respected in international as well as in Palestinian circles, where he was a senior advisor to the late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat and current Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas. It was ironic that Mr. Erekat was being treated in Israel, and there are media reports that there were low-key and small demonstrations outside the hospital by hardline Jews objecting to Israeli doctors treating such a prominent Palestinian. The Palestinians have never considered the USA to be treating both sides fairly, a point made on a number of occasions by Erekat and other Palestinian leaders. After U.S. President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's sole capital at the end of 2017, something the Palestinian side have always opposed and most of the rest of the world regarded as an impediment to permanent peace, the Palestinian leadership broke off diplomatic relations. Then, at the beginning of this year, the new U.S. plan led to renewed tensions as the plan primarily favored the Israeli position. Mahmoud Lamin, Choi TV News. In series of incidents that have shocked many, Mozambique state media reports that more than 50 people have been beheaded in its Cabo Delgado province. More in this report. In what is becoming its signature after attacking villages, the largest number of beheadings are being reported following attacks by an Islamist insurgency by a group which pledges allegiance to the Islamic State. Eyewitnesses who escaped told local media that in one village, the militants turned the local football pitch into a killing ground, where they say people were beheaded and their bodies chopped up. In addition to the beheadings, there are reports of several women being abducted. Fighting has been increasing in the region since an initial outbreak in 2017. It has been alleged that the militants were able to tap into local resentment fueled by displeasure at the lack of development in an area rich in oil and the precious stone rabbi. The war has not made huge international headlines even though an estimated 2,000 people have been killed so far. Although the insurgents have been blamed for the highest number and worst atrocities, local and international human rights organizations have accused government troops of torturing and executing those suspected of collaborating with the rebels. Relief agencies estimate 430,000 have been forced to flee. The gruesome nature of these latest attacks has led to urgent calls from the Mozambican public. According to eyewitnesses who fled to safety, as caused by the state-run Mozambique news agency, 
the gunmen chanted allahu akbar god is the greatest in english fired shots and set homes alight when they raided nanjaba village on friday night it is alleged the beheading started on friday and continued through to sunday in april more than 50 people were beheaded or shot dead in an attack on a village in cabo delgado and earlier this month nine people were beheaded in the same province the government has not shown any signs of wanting to sit down and talk and instead has been requesting international help to defeat the insurgents mozambique is the first place in southern africa to see the presence of a group linked to islamic state mohammed lamin chok tv news as COVID-19 came to dominate all our lives, the race to find a vaccine was on. After several false downs, might there be hope at last? More in this report. Since the coronavirus pandemic swept the globe, scientists and governments have become obsessed with the search for a vaccine. After several stories on the progress of various trials, news broke on Monday that pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, in partnership with BioNTech, the vaccine they describe as being able to prevent more than 90% of people from getting COVID-19. Given the several trials that have raised and then dashed hopes, the joy at the announcement comes with an equal dose of caution. However, unlike some previous announcements that were seen as political, given Pfizer's global reputation, the announcement is being taken seriously. The two pharmaceutical partners have said they will apply in mid-November for emergency use of the vaccine to be approved by German authorities to be used by the end of November. Such has been the rush to get a vaccine that Pfizer's partner, BioNTech, launched a company called Lightspeed in January this year specifically to find a coronavirus vaccine. This trial vaccine is what is called stage 3, which is one stage before approval and general use. There are at least another 12 other trials that have apparently also reached stage 3, although none have said they are equally ready to go into production or that they can claim a 90% prevention rate. Even as health experts caution over safety and scale, the two companies involved in this trial say they are sure of their vaccine. They can produce 50 million doses by the end of 2020 and 1.3 billion by the end of 2021. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has to be kept at remarkably low temperatures and consists of two doses taken three weeks apart. The caution around the announcement reflects that it generally takes up to 10 years for a vaccine to go from trial to approval. This one appears to have been done in 10 months. The negative impact COVID-19 has had on all our lives has forced a radical reassessment of such timeliness. The two scientists being credited with this breakthrough are August Sahin and Oslim Turechi from Germany. Mahmoud Lamin, Choi QTV News. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. After a tightly contested by elections in the Nyamina West constituency, which saw President Barrow's newly formed NPP register their first electoral win, we spoke to the winning and losing candidates to get their reactions. The Secretary General and leader of the National People's Party, President Adam Obara, is quite confident of a landslide victory in 2021 after Saturday's outcome in the Nyamira West and Kirjalga ward by elections. The people of the Republic of China on Monday sent two teams of medical experts to the Gambia to help in the country's battle against the COVID-19 pandemic and contribute towards general health care service delivery. An unidentified witness, a Senegalese national dealing in the palm oil business and a Gambian on Tuesday, testified at the TRRC about their encounter with the NIA. In international news, it has been announced by Malian state media that the country's former president, Amadou Toumani Toure, has died. Saib Erikat, one of the most prominent Palestinians of recent years, has died after contracting the coronavirus. That's all we have for you in this edition of the QTV News. Do stay tuned at 10 p.m. for another edition. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.